Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, if you were here before, thank you for dealing with the technical difficulties. We should have everything fixed now. Um, I'm Christian, one of the booksellers at the Astoria Bookshop. Um, thank you so much for supporting us during this time uh, by attending all of these events virtually and buying our books through bookshop.org and ordering through our website for pick, uh, curbside pickup or shipping at a later date. Um, we have a very exciting event today. Uh, we have two authors who write for very two exciting properties, um, Riverdale and the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. So before we begin, I'm gonna introduce both of them. Um, Sarah Reese Brennan is the author of The Demon's Lexicon and the Lindburn Legacy series, Tell the Wind and Tell the Wind and Fire and in Other Lands, and several collaborations with writers Cassandra Clare, Maureen Johnson, and Kelly Link. Yeah. She lives in Ireland. Nicole Pastel has written over 50 works for readers of all ages, including projects based on properties like Puppet and Vampire Slayer, Charmed, and most recently, Mean Girls, a novel. As a child, she drew her own art economic panels, and in her former life as an editor, she published a Betty and Veronica Mad Libs game. She lives in Brooklyn. Visit her online at NicoleOstyle.com. And now we can begin. All right. Um, Sarah, can you hear me? Me. Maybe there's a. Who's back? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. I can. <laughs> All right. So this interview is definitely haunted. <laughs> That's the first thing, right? Can you not hear me? Hello. Hello. I'm not muted though. Can other people hear me? Beth can hear me. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Should we put the Lawrence Welk back on? I can hear Sarah. Hi. So we're just gonna have Sarah come back in to see if that works. Um, hopefully it works. Maybe the stream is just cursed, who knows? Oh, no. um, but like I said, it's very fitting for the, for the subject today. <laughs> so um, again, thank you everyone for being so patient with all of these difficulties. I hope everyone is using this time um, Think of questions, right? Please. Yes. <laughs> yeah, please think of questions while we. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi. Right, we can hear you. Okay, great. I don't Let me. I think maybe it seems like when I leave, it happens. So maybe I just mute myself. Okay. And just stay here as like a, a benevolent a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just, just a presence. I'll just be here. So let's try that. And if not, we'll figure it out. Okay. All right. Can I, can everyone hear? Sarah, can you hear me? I can hear you. <gasps> okay. Everything's great. All right. <laughs> We're supposed to talk to each other about our books. And also hopefully people will have questions for us. Please have questions for us. I love to ask the questions. I think um, I, but let me start by just apologizing. I think this is clearly my fault. Dark magic has been at work and I'm sorry. I don't even know why I cursed this event. It just seemed like fitting. Like I just wanted to enter into the spirit of everything. I have regretsies. Quarantine's hard on us all. We make poor choices. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm very excited to be here and talking to you about your fine novels. You're very experienced in the art of tie-in books, I know. I am, I am. I um, I started as an editor, actually. That was my first job out of college. Um, and I worked in tie-ins, which I had not even realized was an industry unto itself until I arrived for the interview and realized that I was definitely where I was meant to be. 
Um, and I worked on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Charmed, um, all my favorite TV shows, and eventually uh, started writing for them. So I spent, I have written a lot of original stuff too, but it's fun to be back um, into that world of high-end writing. It's, I really love being able to spend some time with characters that other people have created. I think Sarah can't hear us again. Oh dear. Just if anyone at home can hear me, I just want you to know that my <laughs> our publisher is watching from home and <laughs> writing such cheerful messages to us as this all just <laughs> takes its own life, takes takes its own uh direction. Hello. What third time is a charm, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Let's see if can you hear us now? Yep, everything's great. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself again. We're just gonna keep trying this. <laughs> so, Sarah, can you hear? Yeah. Me? So, I've written five bajillion tie-ins, and I've ghostwritten. Um, how much experience have you had in this world? Uh, in the world of tie-ins, uh, none really. So this, uh, this is your first. This is my first. Well, I did write uh, in the Shadow Hunter anthologies by Cassandra Clare with Maureen Johnson, Robin Wasserman, and Kelly Link, and that was fantastic. But it was a much, it was a less official thing because they're my friends, so they were like, "You want to write these stories?" And I was like, "I have these ideas," and occasionally they would throw a bread basket at my head and be like, "Not that idea." <laughs> uh, but yeah, my beautiful editor at Scholastic was like, would you like to write for property? And I was like, what property? I don't know. And everyone knew that I was really excited for the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina to come because I'm a big fan of the old Sabrina the Teenage Witch show mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of Riverdale and of course your fine novels. And so they were just like, I think you're going to want to hear what she has to say. But then I was very nervous about doing it because, of course, you go into something like this and there are all these fans and you don't want to let them down. And there are all these fine actors and many people behind it. And also Netflix, I think, maybe hires assassins. You do. <laughs> we're not supposed to talk about that. Oh, right. Oh, no. <laughs> So I, um, so like I said, I had edited these for, not these in specific, but I had edited tie-ins for a really long time. So one thing that I think I had really working in my favor coming back as a writer was a real familiarity with the process of working on scripts and dealing with notes from licensors and making it really collaborative and making the work feel original and fresh, but still exist within the, the I don't want to say constraints because they're not constraints, but within the parameters of these pre-existing universes, um, what was that like for you? It's a, It's been such a long time since I was so new to this that I would love to hear about your experience. Um, well, it was very tricky kidnapping the actor. Sorry about that. Um, it seems like Okay, let's add her. Hi, there sorry, we go. Yes, I don't know what's up. We're gonna do this one question at a time. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what um, do I ever just, just you know enjoy the wonderful Riverdale vibes and know that I will come back like a witch kind of passing back and forth or a vampire at the window. Let me in. I'll be here. <laughs> I found uh, do we, are we, are we live? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, guys. I, I don't know. I don't know about the curse. I don't. Um, I don't know. Do you find kidnapping the actress to be hard? No. Say that again. Did you find kidnapping the actress to be hard? <laughs> um, I, again, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> well, you see, I live in Ireland and that's a fairly small island. And whenever the actors came to it, I would just be like, okay, you have to come talk to me now. And they would be like, who are you? No, no, I'm important now. You, you, you're gonna, we're gonna hang out. And that was really nice. Uh, they would talk to me about their characters. And uh, so whenever an actor from the Sabrina comes to Ireland, I just 
quietly kidnap them and make them talk to <laughs> their character, but I released them. It's a catch and release system. Okay. It's, very, <laughs> it's very, um, I don't know what the word is, compassionate. Okay. Very yeah. compassionate. Um, Charlie Jane Andrews was talking on Twitter the other day about tie-in novels and how they work and which tie-in novels like illuminate the world for you. And it did make me think about how illuminate being a great word because there's spaces in every story where we think, oh, I wonder what happened or I wonder what someone felt then or thought then because of course TV has amazing set pieces but you can't quite get into people's minds in the same way as in books. So that was a really a fun idea for me, the idea of finding the spaces in the narrative and illuminating them that perhaps we would like to see. So what was one of your favorite moments of illumination from your book? Oh, oh, um, wow, I was just trying to sound smart. <laughs> um, you go first. <laughs> I have, it's not a very good one, but I realized when I wrote the first one, the prequel novel, um, Riverdale the day before, um, it's the story leading up to the pilot. So it's what everyone was doing literally around that July 4th, right before they find Jason Blossom. Um, and it was, it was fun. I think prequels, prequels are always tricky because you know where you're going to end up and you have to, you really have to go back and fill in those blanks to make it an interesting original story of its own. Um, but I discovered after the fact, because I was being interviewed by someone who is a huge fan of the show, that um, I have, as of now, been the only person who's written dialogue from Jason Blossom. Like on the show, he's only, oh, Sarah's gone again, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, on the show, he's written um, just completely silent, which I did not even process. Of course, if you watch it, you see it, but he doesn't speak on the show. So Jason never speaks on the show, and yet I have him speaking with Cheryl via text message in person throughout the story in the prequel, which makes sense because he's alive. Um, but this interviewer says, well, what is it? what did it feel like writing the first spoken words of Jason Blossom? And I was like, oh, I had, if I had thought about it, I would have made it a lot more interesting. But um, of course, it turns out that the first spoken words are in a text message, and it's him texting Cheryl, hey. <laughs> Jason Blossom's like big first moment of actually speaking in his own voice is, hey. Um, but the exciting thing was that the actor saw that on Twitter and retweeted it, which made me feel very, very famous. So Ooh, that was my little interesting story. Um, yeah, my moment of fame was uh, Miranda Otto, who plays uh, Zelda on The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and of course, Eowyn from The Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. putting my book in her Insta, which was fully like, my 10 year old self just passed out quietly in the back of my mind and it's maybe still there. Um, let me see, uh, liminal space I thought was fun. Okay, so Sabrina has this love triangle going on with a good mortal boy called Harvey and a bad witch boy called Nicholas Scratch. Uh, a name I find hilarious, though I love him. And I noticed how in the first part of the show, Nick is trying to woo Sabrina, but he doesn't really know how to do it because he, the way witches work is, you know, different from the way mortals woo each other. And mortals are like, will we go for the movies? Will we go for a milkshake? And witches are like, hello, would you like a <laughs> dark time of unbridled carnality? And Sabrina's like, oh no, that's fine. You're fine. Thanks though. So I was like, this poor boy, he's doing his best, doesn't know how. <laughs> no one's told him about milkshakes. <laughs> so, and then I noticed in part two, and I talked to the writers of the show about it a bit, that Nick was able to come back and actually be kind of like, okay, what if I held your head? And I was like, who taught him this? <laughs> so in the second Sabrina novel, I had him show up at Harvey's door and be like, hey, how do I woo a lady? And I was like, I don't, I don't want any part of this. <laughs> what have you done? Right. And that was kind of fun for me, the exploring the witch and the human world a little bit, in which, you know, like Nick's just sitting in this world house. He's like, interesting, interesting. It's in the movies, you say. <laughs> oh, projection. Isn't that hot? So, yeah, I tried to have fun with it there, but also being like respectful and thinking out, like, how do you. Oh, Sarah's muted.
She's back. I am back. Please forgive. <laughs> what did I mean? <laughs> oh, I was just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay, so if you were a witch on the TV show or within that universe, um, who would you be? What would you do? Like, uh, I'd be a witch like Aunt Hilda because a lot of her uh, magic is goes around cooking, and because she's super nice and she gets on with witches and mortals, which I think is you know a very nice idea. But also, you know, if you cross her, she might. So like, there's an edge. Yeah, exactly. How I, about you? In the Riverdale universe, we would want to be any special character or belong to any family. Who would I want to be? I mean, I guess just in general, not in Riverdale or in life, I would want to be Cheryl Blossom. Like I, I think, <laughs> like at any point in time, like she is a good a good go to. I think whether you're in the real world or in Riverdale, uh, I think probably there's like. A little bit of all of them in me, with the exception of maybe Archie, because he's like so sporty and American. <laughs> that was very clean cut, but like the brooding writer, you know, the Jughead, sure. Um, the spoiled New Yorker, yes, definitely. I'm sorry to say. Um, and then Betty being, I mean, I, Betty is way more hardcore than I am, but like I would aspire to be as badass as she is. So, um, so a little bit of all of them, but um, but mostly Cheryl, I think. I mean, Cheryl Bombshell, how could you do better? The <laughs> lipstick alone, like it's amazing. I would never be able to pull that off. So uh, I did spend the first couple of episodes of Riverdale thinking that Jughead was a ghost. And so being like, I wonder who will gain the ability to see this ghost. <laughs> <laughs> season five, like a <laughs> style reveal, you know? I mean, it's so clear to me that we should have a crossover. Clearly, I'm just trying to bring the supernatural into Riverdale wherever I can. I would love to do a crossover. And I think, I mean, I love I love Riverdale and I love Sabrina. I love writing Riverdale. Um, and I love that they blend so many different genres. Like, that's one of my favorite things about that show is, is just how, like, one week it's a Sopranos sort of thing. The next week it's Hitchcock and, and they jump around and they're aware of it and it's really heightened and campy in a good way. Um, where was I going with this? My goodness. Uh, oh my God. Like mishmash. Mishmash, but there was something about the mishmash and I totally spaced. Oh my goodness. I feel like now I should pretend that I've gone mute because I can't remember where I was going with this. Let's talk about Death of a Cheerleader. Um, it is the title of an amazing movie starring Tori Spelling. So it is with great pleasure that I discover that whenever you Google this, you get my book and the Tori Spelling movie. I think that adds to the value of Googling this book. I love this cover. Um, do I have any more questions for you? Oh, we were talking about crossovers. We were talking about crossovers. Um, I would love to do a crossover. I would love for there to be, and I, I say this, I guess my hesitance is that I don't want to suggest that there's anything that, that is <laughs> absent from Riverdale, because of course there isn't. But course, yeah. I would love for there to be would be um, real, like for the Black Hood to actually be a demon or for the Gargoyle King to be magic. Like the fact that it that nothing is ever truly supernatural, like as someone who loves like horror stories, I, I always want to go that one step further and have it actually be magic. And of course, if Sabrina were to come to Riverdale, then that would be the outcome. So, um, so I don't see that happening anytime soon, but I would love to write that. It would be fun. I had a whole idea that perhaps Harvey and Archie could meet while Harvey is fighting demons and Archie could be like, are you like on the run from a bear or the <laughs> Lord? Um, but I was told I was totally forbidden to do it and I get one. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. I, I've had a lot of fun. Like I saw that you had a Jughead um, reference in your first book and I had in the second book in um, Get Out of Town when they're driving to Veronica's um, family's compound, the lake compound, uh, a black cat crosses their path. And I don't know if you would know it necessarily, but to me, that was definitely Salem. Uh, and then of course, in, in Death of a Cheerleader, um, they're at this um, campsite or campgrounds rather with other cheerleaders from other schools. And some of them are from Greendale. So there's a lot of like explicit discussion of the fact. I mean, we don't 
I think we sort of dance around like the witchcraft aspect of it, but definitely there's a lot of conversation about how people have opinions about um, Greendale and about the weird things that go on there. And some people think it's magic, so. Yeah, I had um, in the third part, Sabrina and her best friend Roz joined the cheerleading squad. So I was thinking about how that might've happened and had Roz had a little encounter with a cheerleader who was like talking about social justice for cheerleading and, uh, Cheryl's uh, romance and how they su or they supported their sapphic cheer sisters and Ross was like, I think the cheerleaders seem nice. I'm going to join the team. So that was a little shout out to our mutually beloved Cheryl Bombshell. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, no, I mean, uh, I oh, I also had a little bit where. Uh, Let me see if I have, I have some, this is the Riverdale season three graphic novel. I shall hold this up. Um, the amazing people at Archie were nice enough to ask me to try my hand at writing some comics. Uh, and after I wrote the season of comics, they bound them into this beautiful graphic novel. Sorry, I was just holding up covers. So, oh. <laughs> and a white thing. But anyway, these are the, um, this is the season three graphic novel. Um, so I got to write some of the Riverdale comics, which was so much fun. I shall put that back now. No, I like oh. it. <laughs> um, I think that all of our covers are very good because the show has such a strong aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, sort of retro vibes, but with like the dark mystery going on. And so, and also like progressively darker. And then you're like, oh, here's Sabrina. She's just hanging out. She's nearby. And you're like, oh, here's Sabrina, book two. Everything's all darker. She's got her evil cat. Not that Salem's evil. I love Salem. Right. Uh, and then Path of Night, book three. Oh, she's at the gates of hell. No big deal. Cool. <laughs> and so I just love having such a visual thing to engage with and then being like, okay, the words. The words are us. <laughs> so, um, so that made me remember last, Oh my goodness, last year, I think at Comic Con, um, I was on a panel with Archie, um, obviously not Archie the character, but Archie <laughs> the entity, um, all of whom are so amazing. And if they're watching, hello, thank you for <laughs> this opportunity. Um, but so I was on this panel, and there's a lot of cosplay, obviously, it being Comic Con, and like dead center in the front row was the most amazing Sabrina Spellman, like with the white hair and the red sweater. And it was just like to a T, she looked Perfect. So, and um, I'm wondering, you know, one thing I found with Riverdale versus a lot of the other properties I've worked on, and some of that is because it's 2020 and fan culture has really exploded, but the response that I see online is crazy. I mean, in a good way, but people love the show. People care so much. People comment on everything, like they're following in a way that I don't remember from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer days, probably because the internet was different then. But so I'm wondering what, um, if you have any like great stories from things you've heard about from fans, like emails you've gotten, questions you've gotten. Um, I mean, a lot of them. I too have seen some really great uh, Riverdale and Sabrina cosplays. I was walking through a convention hall at one point in uh, the Grand Rapids and there was a great Sabrina and I was just like, hey, you're a great Sabrina. I write the books. <laughs> it's like that was some sort of, she was just like. <laughs> Christian, do we have any questions? Are there any questions from anyone? I I, I wrote one in the comments, but I actually do have a question to kind of start things off. Um, I was wondering how is it to like write these novels with like, you know, comparative to writing your own like original works, like you have like kind of a baseline of what you have to work within. So how do you plan like out writing something for like a, a property like Riverdale or Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, like how do you like kind of get into the mindset of like writing these? Um, I, it seems to be one of my very few questionable life skills is that I'm actually pretty good at get jumping in and out of different voices. I've written for, you know, picture books, I've written nonfiction, like going into different genres and different voices is like a weird skill of mine. And I don't, you know, for better or for worse. 
Um, I think in some ways for me, writing tie-ins is easier than writing original in that with the original, you have to wait for the idea and then sort of have your like tortured existential artist phase where you're staring at the screen and you're trying to figure out your characters and all of that stuff for me is, is really difficult, especially when you're just sort of writing it for yourself, you know, whereas when someone says to me, hey, there's this show with these characters, can you do it? I mean, that's much easier for me than having to make it all up in my head. But I will say in a lot of ways, it's actually much, much harder because the deadlines are super tight as opposed to when I'm just sort of sitting around fantasizing about my own worlds and when it's done, it's done, you know. So the deadlines are very tight. And and of course, you know, you're a fan. You want to be able to enter that world and, and do right by it and make sure that you're giving the fans and the licensors and your editors what they want. So, um, so in that sense, for me, at least, it's a real challenge. Um, and I find specifically when I'm working on tie-ins, I'm much more regimented. I don't, I don't work long days, but I work in like very intense bursts. And I usually have um, a pretty, a pretty strong sense of how many words I need to write a day. And I'm doing it like every day. And it's very, um, it's almost mechanical. Not that that's a bad thing, but it's like, I'm in a zone that doesn't necessarily happen when I'm being more um, free flowing about it. Yeah, um, well, for me, it was really important to fall in love. So I just kept uh, looking at it and be like, which one do I love? And then I decided that I, I love the idea of this family, like a weird magic family in the midst of like darkness on both sides, but who really love each other. And that that is what shaped our heroine. Yeah, I think finding your entry point into the show is the first step in ever really appreciating it and being able to write to it well. This is a foreign edition. Oh, yay! <laughs> so sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so falling in love, I decided that I loved the heroine's uh, criminal cousin, Ambrose, and saw how tight they were, but how different they were. And then I was like, okay, that's the prequel, talking about Ambrose and his past and how he and Sabrina came to be this great team. And then, you know, looking around at all the characters and as the story moves on, being like, who would I like to hear from? And who has undergone some development behind the scenes that we could look into? and that that would be fun. So thinking about who has the story to tell, but it is really useful to know where you're going. And like you were saying, of course the deadlines are tight because they're like, well, the show's gonna show when it shows, friends. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me, once I'm in love, I'm quite chatty. So right. um, I had the problem of, and I think my editor was a little surprised. I was like, here's the book. And she's like, these are meant to be short novels. They're <laughs> and I was like, oh God. So we had to cut 20,000 words from one book. Cutting is, I think, better than having to write more though, right? I mean. It shows my enthusiasm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think you, I think that's a really good point you make. I said this when you were out and back in, that I think like having to find your entry point and finding your character and how you connect with them and really coming to like um, sympathize with them is, is a way to make, to make yourself um, part of the process in a really like full-bodied sort of way, like to really flesh out the story. Yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the live comments now because I think, I think our moderator may be having technical difficulties. Um, so one of the questions, a lot of people who are very excited about the books and the TV show, so thank you so much, guys. Um, and now Chris wants to know what are your favorite parts to write for for both of your tie-in novels so I'm going to interpret that as like who my favorite character is and mm -hmm. I would say um honestly I love them all I think I think Archie is the most difficult because he's a little bit straightforward where like with um Veronica she's sarcastic she's um sophisticated she's urbane and then with Cheryl it's like she's like Veronica but then find the most 
bananas old fashioned expression you can find and use that one instead of the one that Veronica would use. So I find those to be a little bit um a little bit a little bit more fun and a little bit more challenging to work on um than Archie. So I would say Cheryl and Veronica are my top two. I think I'm alone. Okay, so there's a question here. How did the Riverdale, there's a question here. How did the Riverdale teens hear about the stuff that happened in Greendale? And the answer, I think you're referring to death of a cheerleader and how the cheerleaders had heard about these deaths, these, these rumors that of, of deaths and violence that had gone on in Greendale. Um, the answer of how they heard about it is that the towns are not that far apart. Um, in my opinion, in my in my belief, I was writing from the place of believing that the towns are not that far apart, and that we know, for instance, that Ms. Grundy goes to Greendale after she leaves um, Riverdale. So I have to, I have to assume that word travels, right? Like these are the kind of things that would travel. But yeah. Sarah, who, um, who are your favorite characters to write for? Oh well, I mean, like I said at first, I was just like, I'm all about Ambrose. And then there was the process of falling in love with everyone, really. So now my my friends uh, in real life do not like talking about this. Because like, if one of them says anything bad about any of the characters, I'm like, OK, I'm going to fight you. Right. <laughs> I'm like, let me tell you about my sweet angel Harvey. And they're like, no, please don't tell us about your sweet angel Harvey. Um, so there are a few characters who you know, I'd be less fond of. But the, the main cast I've grown super endeared to all of the Spellmans. I love that Sabrina tries so hard and does so many big things. I love Lilith, the mother of demons. She can certainly, like, if she, like, eats somebody in a sandwich, I'll just be like, hmm, it's fine. Good choice. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I agree also that I'm like, well, there are mentions of like uh, in Sabrina, they go to Riverdale briefly. And so I had to, Harvey's brother is buried across the Sweetwater River. Yeah. There's just a sense of geography. And that's something that we created as authors. I mean, I think we're doing our best to like leave little breadcrumbs and Easter eggs. Exactly. That, I mean, in my opinion, that's actually like pretty well established on the shows. Definitely. Um, like, and I love that uh, in Sabrina, like Ambrose and Sabrina who are like, witches who are into dark magic were like, oh God, do we dare go to Riverdale? <laughs> and it did make me think about like uh, in book three, uh, Theo is talking about wanting a boyfriend. And someone's like, oh, Riverdale boys are hot. And then someone's like, Riverdale boys are hot. <laughs> you don't mess with that. No. <laughs> you don't go near them. Betty will cut you. Hot. They are cute. <laughs> I will agree. The boys of Sabrina are cute too. Come on. Everybody <laughs> in universes is, is pretty cute. Um, pretend this is a BuzzFeed quiz. <laughs> Which Riverdale or Sabrina character are you and why? Um, again, I think I'm a mix of Jughead um, and Veronica with a dash of Cheryl. Probably Jughead and Veronica most is, is the mashup of who I am on Riverdale. And with also, I sort of feel like, look, I'm a mom, you know, I, I watch these shows about teenagers. I'm not a teenager. I mean, let's be real. I'm probably Hermione Lodge, like, but, but if you're asking me to take the BuzzFeed quiz, it's, it's Veronica and Jughead mashed together. So who would you be? Um, well, like I said, I would love to be Hilda. Yes. However, I have been well known to have a crazy plan. I've been almost arrested in a bunch of countries uh, for no good reason. And I did nothing wrong. I just had some plans. I took some dares. <laughs> and so I would say sometimes like either Sabrina or Harvey, who are both really impulsive characters in a way that I enjoy. I, I love it when they rock up and are like, I have an idea. Let's blow up the gates of hell with dynamite. And everyone else is like, <laughs> what if we did not do that? And so I'm like, every now and then I, I've seen that expression of my friends' faces where I'm like, hmm. So I took this dare. And anyway, it turns out you shouldn't eat a vase full of daffodils. Huh. Yeah. It will make you very unwell. Don't do it, guys. That's my idea. Like a good idea. I, it doesn't, but I'm, now I have so many more questions for you. Like, we'll have, we'll have a little side chat in the private. <laughs> now I want to know more about I, I'm like not an adventurous person at all. So. 
<laughs> I need to know more about these dares. <laughs> oh no, I've let on my only weakness, except for all the other weaknesses. <laughs> okay, so do you think, here's a question for you. Do you think that at some point the weird, <laughs> oh wait, maybe it's for both of us. The weird sisters messed around with some serpents or bulldogs. I mean, why not? Like, I mean, I'm sure they did. Like mortal boys or they're like, both their brother of me. There's no one on either side of that equation that I that would walk away from that, right? Like they'd both be pretty down, I think. So probably tormenting mortal boys is their business, and business is good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, of course, well, you know, things are are not looking great for the weird sisters about now. So perhaps the serpents and the bulldogs are currently being like, "We're so lonely. Where are the boys, <laughs> girls? Whatever happened to them?" I mean, no one has, has imperiled my immortal soul in weeks, frankly. Um, what was the hardest thing for you, do you think, in getting into uh, Riverdale specifically? Huh, that's such a good question. Um, you would think I'd be more prepared for it. Uh, <laughs> I think the hardest part was, and remains throughout, uh, giving all of the characters equal airspace in all my stories because each time with each story, hello, um, <laughs> I was saying that I think just giving them all equal airspace, all the characters, because um, with each with each story, you know, there are naturally characters who are going to be more proactive and more involved in the main <laughs> plot. Um, and then you have your favorites, even though you don't you don't want to admit it. And so I think as I'm writing, I'm often like, oh wait, don't forget to include that little bit of subplot because just because you're in love with this this mm -hmm. thing happening over here, don't forget about that. So I think balancing, like there are so many characters and they're all awesome, but they don't always all fit in one story. And I can't just write my favorite parts. Like I have to find a way to make it all work. Yeah, I, I agree. Balance is tricky. Um, Path of Night, uh, in which uh, the heron's boyfriend, Nick, is in hell. So I was like, well, they're in a, the world's worst long distance relationship. So you can't really do much with that romance. So you had to kind of go in on both characters and their insecurities and Nick, you know, battling with his own soul in hell, but being like, I hope my girlfriend's doing okay. <laughs> Probably better than me. Right. Uh, and of course, you do fall in love with the storyline. Um, in book two, I had Prudence, the mean girl of the Magical Academy, decided to parent trap her evil father and Zelda Spellman. <laughs> so she was running around trying to set them up so she could have Zelda as a mom, basically, which is kind of sad. Wow. Um, these are magical hijinks of the highest order. I'm having a great time. And then I was like, wait, when was the last time we saw Sabrina? <laughs> Right, exactly. Yeah, no, I've definitely, definitely had experiences like that. Um, if you could pick which character's fashion style would you emulate? Ooh. I mean, uh, I think Sabrina herself, actually, especially in part three, because it's interesting how uh, in season one, she's kind of buttoned down a bit more and her hair is still blonde, of course. And then in season two, she kind of goes hard the other way to witch in short skirts and hanging out with the bad boys and girls. And then in three, she seems to find like a place in between, like a sort of goth secretary vibe, which I enjoy. Yeah. Um, although think, uh, Lilith is always so beautifully dressed, but I just couldn't pull it off. Right. <laughs> I think my favorite on Riverdale in terms of like wearability, like Cheryl is is hands down the best. I think Veronica is probably the one I would emulate, but I will say that it's been like maybe in college I ran around in heels to classes and stuff, but it's been a long time since I wore heels with the regularity that Veronica Lodge does. And certainly for the types of events that she wears them. So um, it's goals, but it's aspirational. So... I, I honestly don't know how much more time we have because um, I'll check on the, I'll check, I'll check and see what Christian said. But in the meantime, are there any crossover ships you'd like to see? I mean, the, I will just chime in that in the comics, if you don't read the comics, you first of all, absolutely should. But in the comics, there is an Archie and Sabrina. So if that's something you ship, like it exists in the world, go find it. 
<laughs> the believe in the ship you wish to see in the world. Yeah. And I do like the idea of you and Veronica. I think, you know, you could pull off a Veronica style cape. I could be into it. <laughs> I mean, okay. eh, you know, look, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I mean, if you dare me, find me like the appropriate dare. Okay. Nice <laughs> We're going to be on a dare. Is this, we're going to be on a daring streak. All right, you guys, I am so sorry for the curse I laid on this, but it's been really exciting to talk to you. And we have time for one more question. Ah. <laughs> what? Who is this? <laughs> uh, when I did the Lord of the Rings reference in Path of Night, how hard was it for you not to write that Eowyn has a certain resemblance to Zelda? Actually, that was part of the 20,000 words that got cut. Harvey's like, I'm telling you, Eowyn looks just like Sabrina's Aunt Zelda. And Theo's like, no, Harvey, you're crazy. She doesn't. You're such a nerd. Why are you always like this? Uh. <laughs> so if there is a bad joke to be made, friends, I will make it every time. <laughs> I don't think that's a bad joke. I think that's a great little inside joke. I can see why if you're running long, it might not be integral. But I would enjoy that joke. <laughs> Thanks, friend. <laughs> Hello. He's back. I can, can you hear him? No. No. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi. Oh, okay. What adventure this has been? <laughs> um, this has been certainly a, a venture. <laughs> um, thank you so much for everyone for joining us, even with all of the technical difficulties that we've been having. Um. Thank you so much, Sarah and Nicole, for joining us and talking about your wonderful books. Thank you for having uh, us. Thank you for course. having us. Thank you guys for watching. It's so fun. Thank you, I'm thank so you sorry watching. about that. And thank you for being so brave. Sold your own alone, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and if you would like to buy either um, Path of Night or Death of a Cheerleader, we have them on bookshop.org. Um, where we have the links for below, or you can just go on bookshop.org and search for the books there. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>